Welcome to this compendium to D2L. In it, we are going to go through a number of tools in order to actually build deep learning networks in practice. And we're going to do this by showing you how to actually execute the various notebooks from D2L with some explanations and sometimes some simplifications. Yeah. And sometimes we'll also skip a little bit forward because it may take quite a while to train some networks. Okay, so we start by loading a deep learning framework. In this case, we're going to pick PyTorch. So that works by running import torch. Okay. Now, once we have that, well, we might as well start by defining a vector. In this case, we are just going to define a 12 dimensional vector, print it, look at its shape, and look at the number of elements. So x dot shape and x dot num l, as in number of elements, will do just that. Okay, and very unsurprisingly, a 12 dimensional vector has 12 elements and it's of size 12 dimensions. Okay, so you might wonder what's the difference between shape and num l. Well, once we go from vectors to matrices and to tensors, one will contain the you know the size in each dimension and the other one will contain the total size so for instance for a three by four matrix the number of elements is going to be 12 but the shape isn't going to be a one by 12 vector okay so speaking of which we can now do exactly that and we could print The shape as well and not very surprisingly now x dot shape gives us a 3 by 4 vector and our 12 entries are arranged in order from 0 to 11 as we would expect now the other thing that we can do is we can initialize vectors rather than just having them as you know blank memory and so we can for instance initialize them as zeros and ones and well very unsurprisingly, well, that actually happens. Now, this is a tensor of two by three by four, which is why you're going to see 24 ones on the screen if I were to execute just all the zeros, right? So we could do this, we'd get all zeros. Okay. Now, if all zeros and all ones are boring, sometimes we might want to add some you know random numbers and for instance you could have gaussian random entries there are also a lot of other random number generators but in this case we're going to be looking at gaussians and if you execute this then well you see gaussians and of course if you want to explicitly instantiate the tensor with some particular values well you can do that too in which case you get exactly that tensor so if we want to replace this number here, let's say by uh, 99, well, you could do that. Okay. So nothing particularly special. This is very similar to what NumPy does. Okay. The other nice thing is, uh, as you would expect, you can do all the operations with those tensors as you would. Namely, you could, for instance, add them, subtract from them from each other, multiply them, they work divide them or exponentiate one by another. Okay, so let's do that. And yep, x plus y, well, one plus two is three, so that's not very surprising. And since y is all twos, the last entry is just the squares of all the first ones. Uh, mind you, you can also exponentiate things and a lot of other things like, you know, trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, and all of that. So this is really just a mechanism for you to do low level operations on tensors directly in case you need to define them. For instance, if you want to define a new deep network. Okay. Now, the other thing that you might sometimes want to do is concatenate vectors. So for instance, we take some vector that's, you know, a three by four vector, and then we define, you know, a tensor that's, you know, rather specific, and then we just concatenate it together. And so you get um, 
this thing here where the so in the first case we concatenated that tensor in you know the vertical manner and here we concatenate the same tensor in the horizontal manner and you can see the same entries here just that now they are um, the first block is here and now the same block would be over there right so nothing particularly special but it basically allows you to paste vectors to, and matrices together as you please. Okay. Now, of course, there is more than that. You can, for instance, try to compare matrices, and this will give you a tensor of trues and false. And sometimes you might want to sum things up. Why might you want to do that? Well, for instance, let's say I compute losses on a lot of images, let's say maybe a thousand images, and I want to get the aggregate loss such that I can then afterwards optimize. In that case, I should probably sum over all the entries before I can do something else. Okay. Um, lastly, and you probably already know that from NumPy, there's the so-called broadcasting mechanism. And what that means is that I can go and combine objects, even though they may be of different sizes, as long as in their matching dimension, either the numbers match or there's a one correspondingly, right? So for instance, if I have a matrix of size three by one and another one of size one by two, then it will appropriately broadcast that into a three by two object. And so let's look at what those beautiful objects are. So it's zero, one, and two, and zero and one. Now, if I add them together, it creates a two by three object. And of course, the numbers are added appropriately. Okay, so this is exactly where those numbers came from. Right. Now, the last thing that you pretty much need is indexing and slicing. So if you want to get the last element, then as you would expect, it's the minus one as the entry. And if you give it a range, then well, it does exactly that, namely grabs a range. Now you can use that to set specific entries. So if you recall that, actually let's print out X first and then we get that again. So if you compare those two matrices, you can see that the entry, you know, one and two has been set to nine. So that's this entry here, right? Of course, one and two means second row, third column, because we're indexing in Python land. But short of that, that's exactly what happens. then the next thing that you sometimes care about is you want to assign multiple elements the same value which you can do okay very unsurprisingly if i select the first two rows and set the value to 12 well then you know that's what happens now of course with all that assigning going on sometimes you can end up using up a lot of memory you might think that this is you know CPUs and GPUs have plenty of memory. Well, actually not really. Once you start looking at things like BERT, you may end up needing more than one GPU to even fit everything in. So in that case, it really behooves you to be very careful with saving memory and keeping it concise. Um, I think it's a good practice to start doing this right from the get-go and not to have essentially unused memory sitting around very much. So be mindful of how many copies you make because that actually also makes your code slower. So to give you an idea of what happens, if I have some you know, variable y before and then I add x to y and reassign that to y, then, well, you would expect that afterwards 
the memory reference to y is different. So let's have a look at that. And yes, very unsurprisingly, the ID of y before is not the same as the memory reference to y afterwards. Now, if we want to specifically do that assignment, right? So we can, for instance, you know, assign x plus y to z, then I would do this, right? And so now I get exactly the same memory location. So looking at the previous example, what I would have had to do is simply assign y to the same location as that. And now we should see true as we would expect it. Okay. So this happened because we actually assigned the result of x plus y to the memory location in y. I mean, one of the reasons for doing this is because, well, Python isn't very good at dealing with pointers. It kind of does all of this implicitly and you really usually don't need to, you know, free memory and all of that. And the benefit of simplicity or the downside of simplicity is that sometimes you pay a little bit in efficiency. Okay. Another way how to do this is just plus equals, right? So these are the in-place operations and yeah. That does the same thing. Okay, the last thing that you may want to do occasionally is you may want to move objects from PyTorch land to NumPy land. The reason for that being that a lot of libraries are written for NumPy and so you need to get data in and out of PyTorch. The problem is that your tensors may sit in PyTorch on the CPU or on the GPU. And as soon as you run this conversion to or from NumPy, everything stops and everything just waits until that conversion has happened. So the worst thing that you can do in terms of performance is if you convert one scalar at a time. So it's better to just, you know, have some larger pooling object in memory in on the NumPy side or on the PyTorch side and then move everything at once. And this way you can benefit from some degree of parallelism, whereas otherwise you're completely killing performance. And maybe your eight super high performance GPUs will sit idly by while the lone Python thread converts things into NumPy land. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens. So if I just have a NumPy object and a PyTorch object, then, well, of course, their types are different. Now I can go and, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, convert things. And by the way, here you could see that, you know, torch tensor of A simply went and took the NumPy object and converted it into PyTorch land, right? But Conversely, I can take, you know, a PyTorch object and move it over to, you know, a float or an integer and it'll do that just fine. Or the item operation. And with that, we're done with a very, very basic brief introduction to the absolute bare bones details of the tensor object in PyTorch. We're going to go through a little bit more of that later on when we look at linear algebra, but for now, that's it for this lecture. Thanks for listening.